My name is Adam Verdon. I was six years old when I first dared to wonder aloud why I had never met my grandmother, Audrey. Every Friday at school, they sent us home with the cafeteria's lunch menu for the following week. At the bottom of one of these, they'd added a note that Grandparents' Day was coming up the day before Thanksgiving. Where does Grandma live? I asked my father at the dinner table that night. And he told me that Grandma lived in Canada and led a very simple life on a farm without a phone. I'd received a birthday card from her two years before in 1974, but not since. One day, my father said, she'd visit or we'd fly out. But as the years went on and only one more birthday card ever came, signed with just my grandmother's name and nothing else, I detected an unwillingness on my father's part to ever mention her. He was a great man in many ways, but he could be severe. He was a television director, and to me, he always seemed to come home under great stress. I learned not to challenge him. Here's all I'd managed to glean about Grandma Audrey. She'd given birth to my father when she was very, very young, and had married again after her divorce from my grandfather a sailor. My father had run away from home when he was 16 and never looked back. For all my childhood, my mother seemed to silently follow his lead and revealed almost nothing about the woman either. Even those two birthday cards were presented to me without envelopes, and so I never saw the address they came from. <clears throat> okay. I want to go back and establish the timeline of your visit to 530 Lamp Road. Uh, you said initially that you got there at about half past two. Is that right? Yeah. So take me through, uh, describe for me what you saw as you approached the property from the time you turned off the highway. From the five, I got on Lamp Road for about a fifth of a mile. And then it diverted to the left and right. I went right and went down a path. It was gravel, kind of through some woods. And then there was an open clearing, and that's where the house was. So without any signs on that road, without a house number, how did you know you'd arrived? Where you intended? I saw someone had painted on a tree before the fork. There were three numbers, 530. And 550 and I think 570 and 530 had an arrow to the right it was kind of a guess okay and uh, where did you leave your vehicle when you stopped it in the grass there wasn't a driveway or anything it was just kind of a field there how far away from the house were you about 20 yards and the ice cream truck was where in relation to your car off to my left, about 20 feet away. Did you know what it was when you first saw it? I knew it was an ice cream truck, that's it. And how would you describe the condition of the house from the outside? Uh, dilapidated, not very well cared for. One night when I was 11 or 12, January, I think it was, I was up in my room and I heard my father downstairs arguing with someone on the phone. It escalated gradually, with my mother occasionally urging my father to lower his voice, but he was clearly flustered. When it became clear to me that he was yelling at Grandma Audrey over the line, I crept out of my room to the top of the staircase and sat on the third step from the top, listening raptly. My father was making it abundantly clear to Audrey that not only would we not be visiting her anytime soon, she was not welcome in our home. The last words I heard my father say were, You need to learn about consequences. Then he hung up. There was some hushed conversation between he and my mother, which I couldn't hear. When I sensed him leaving the kitchen, I scrambled back to my room and turned up the TV feeling ashamed. The next day, my mother finally broke her silence. 
I remember I was in the backyard near dusk playing pitchback in the early evening chill. You know, the game where you throw a tennis ball at a metal frame with a taut netting and it bounces back to you again and again. My father was off buying a car in Burbank. I went inside our kitchen to see what was for dinner, and my mother was just putting some spaghetti on the table for me. We ate as it got dark outside. So, your grandma, she said at one point obviously realizing she and my father couldn't go on like this forever, keeping her a secret. My mother told me Audrey had a problem, a compulsion, which kept her from having a normal life and kept causing her to make some very bad decisions. What that compulsion was exactly, I was a little afraid to ask, and details were not forthcoming. But it was the reason my father had run away from home when he was a teenager, and until Grandma got her compulsion under control, if she ever could, my father thought it was best to keep our lives very separate. I assumed the issue was alcohol, maybe even hard drugs, or maybe she was a thief. I asked if she was dangerous. No, my mother assured me, not dangerous. But that didn't mean it was a good thing to be around her. She advised me to follow my father's cue, not get overzealous, and eventually I'd be able to make up my own mind about Grandma, who was still quite young then. That year, by my calculations, she would have only turned 48. Of course, at 12, this seemed incredibly old to me. But I did exactly what my mother told me. I waited. I pretty much forgot about Grandma. It wasn't like I was lacking in things to think about, daydream about explore. The night after my graduation from high school, about five years later, in 1988, my father came home from work unusually early, about five o'clock. My mother hastily made him some dinner, which he ate quickly over the sink, and then he got ready to go out again. I was in the basement sorting some clothes to be donated when he appeared in the doorway to let me know he'd be back again the next night, and maybe we could have a game of backgammon then. No explanation about where he was going. When he did return on June 11, it was almost midnight. I was in the kitchen making a Mama Celeste pizza. He came in shaking the water from his hair. It was still raining lightly hours after it had started. He sat down, utterly exhausted. He told me he'd been visiting my grandmother in the hospital, near Montreal, nearly 3,000 miles away. She had nearly died. It was her compulsion, he told me. She couldn't control herself, and for the second time in five years, she had paid an awful physical price. But instead of finally telling me exactly what that compulsion was, my father only lectured to me very quietly. Do not fall into the belief, he said, that family ties are unbreakable. You have a responsibility only to yourself in this life. Sentimentality will trap you. Sentimentality will drag you down. He told me to consider my grandmother something from the past or something that never truly was and move on. He'd already spent too much time going back to his childhood, he said. He was done. With that, he got up from the kitchen table and went to bed. I was 21 before I finally learned he'd never gone to Montreal. He'd spent the night of June 10th instead at a motel 19 miles from our house, checking in there after visiting Grandma in nearby Henry Mayo Newall Hospital as she lay near death. The Canada lie was meant to deceive me into thinking she still lived far enough away to put her out of mind. Since 1972, she had never lived more than an hour's drive away. Now, uh, you did not approach the ice cream truck at first, correct? <clears throat> no, I went right up to the house. So what details of the truck did you glean as you went by it? Just the name on the side of it and that it was kind of old. Did you look through its windows at all? Or? Uh, no, from that angle I couldn't really even if I wanted to. 
Were there any signs of it being driven recently or moved? No. All right. I'm going to show you a photo. You don't remember seeing this handprint on the side of the truck? Right there, near the wheel well? In March of 1992, a few days after my 22nd birthday, my fiancé showed me a snippet from the police beat section of the Santa Clarita newspaper and asked me, Could this be your grandmother they're talking about? Audrey Verdon, age 58, had been arrested for trespassing, burglary, and theft on the campus of Cal State Fullerton University. No, I said without looking at the full snippet. My grandmother lived in Canada. She wasn't local. I went back to trying to fix the screen on my laptop. I hope not, said my fiancé, because this woman seems deeply disturbed. I asked her what she meant, and she handed me the newspaper. Two weeks later, I walked into Orange County Circuit Court to witness the sentencing in the case of Audrey Verdon and see my grandmother for the first time in my life. She did not know I was in the gallery, one of only three people to attend as spectators by my count. Neither my mother nor my father knew I was there, either. The case was not a very complex one, and there had been no actual trial. My grandmother had agreed to enter an Alford plea, accepting a guilty verdict on certain conditions beneficial to her as a defendant. That afternoon, there was to be simply a summation of the case by both sides before a judge, a reading of the plea and a formal agreement to it, and then sentencing, which had been arranged beforehand. I was about 12 feet from my grandmother when she came into the room behind her court-appointed attorney. At 58, she looked probably 10 years older than her age. Her hair was long and dyed black. She was thin, pale, and small. Her skin was blotchy. Her eyes seemed very alive, though, very green and vivid. The resemblance to my father was undeniable. She sat down calmly, dressed in a white blouse that was too big for her. Grandma Audrey had been arrested a little after 4 a.m. on July 13th, leaving the grounds of Cal State Fullerton in a 1981 Toyota Corolla after swerving dramatically on a campus feeder road, though she'd only been going about 15 miles per hour. Upon being pulled over by campus security, she was detained until a state patrol car could come, and a formal arrest was made. In the back seat of my grandmother's car had been a banana crate filled with 12 bottles of dark liquid. She'd broken into a chem lab just a few hundred yards away and taken them from a medical refrigerator. The blood in those bottles was being used as part of an eight-month university study on tetanus vaccinations. It had been extracted from children. After the prosecution's four-minute summation of the case, my grandmother's attorney rose and explained to the judge that an Alford plea was to be entered today, with both the prosecution and the defense having agreed that because the monetary value of the stolen samples could not be established as having risen to the level of a felonious offense without the further cooperation of the biomedical company that produced them, cooperation the company was unwilling or unable to provide at that time, it was more expedient to settle the case now. My grandmother was asked to stand to enter her plea. She was asked a series of questions requiring a one-word response. Did she understand that an Alford plea was equivalent to a guilty plea? Did she understand that she was waiving her right to a trial, etc.? To each question, she answered yes, automatically, robotically. When the list of questions was complete, she was free to walk out of the courtroom, her deal to receive a sentence of four years probation complete. She exchanged a quiet word with her attorney and left. No mention had been made by either the prosecution or the defense about the accused's intention for the bottles she'd stolen from the chem lab or how she'd known where to find them. Arguments of motive had apparently been deemed by both sides as either irrelevant or out of bounds in this oh-so-minor case. 
which seem to have been affected greatly by both the biochem companies and the university's interest in resolving things as quietly as possible. From a good distance away, I saw Grandma Audrey collect her things from a property desk located down a quiet hallway and leave the courthouse alone. From the lobby of the building, I watched her cross the parking lot and get into the same car in which she had been arrested. She pulled into traffic and disappeared. There was a more familiar car waiting for me at my apartment when I got there 15 minutes later. My mother got out of it and intercepted me. My fiancé had told her where I had been. It was time to reveal more of the story. Mom and I went to a nearby coffee house where she told me she'd seen the notice in the newspaper about Audrey's arrest and had tried to keep it from my father. So far, she believed she thought she'd been successful, but it was likely only a matter of time before he found out about what had happened. It was true. Audrey had always lived in the area kept away from the family first by obfuscation and then outright intimidation. My father was unswerving in his insistence that she come nowhere near. No one seemed to know exactly how my grandmother's compulsion had taken hold, my mother told me, but she gleaned in the years of her marriage that my father traced it to the accident which had taken my granduncle's life when he and his sister were 11 years old. Audrey had witnessed it, a collision between two boats. It had apparently been gruesome, multiple victims, and there had followed a couple of years of intense, silent withdrawal from everything around her during a most critical time in her emotional development. Maybe it was significant somehow that this development took place while she was spending her nights and summers working as a specimens packer for a company in Altadena called Oakwood Biological Supply, which provided legally sourced animal remains for use in scientific study and classroom teaching. About 30 years later, they'd begin to provide film productions with remains for use in simulating gore. This was a fact of my grandmother's life I had to research myself. Whisperings among the extended family, which cropped up in letters and rumors over the decades, hinted that she'd first drunk human blood as a teenager, and had never stopped. This was not being a vampire, my mother pointed out, as she understood it. Audrey had never attacked anyone. This was hematomania, an undeniable craving for the sensations that drinking blood brought for some of restored vitality, of an imagined extended youth. The act itself was medically endurable, if unhealthy, and didn't necessarily point to an aberrant lifestyle or one that couldn't be compartmentalized. But Audrey was different somehow. She dropped out of high school to give birth to my father and was married shortly after. Only three weeks after that courthouse ceremony, her husband tried to have her committed to a psychiatric facility. She went on to have several jobs. She tried another marriage after the first one disintegrated. She did provide for her only child, but the compulsion was apparently always there. My father had learned of it very suddenly one day when he was 12. Audrey was raising him alone by then. There came a week when she simply couldn't seem to get out of bed. He once told my mother of a three-day stretch when he only knew Audrey as a weak voice through her bedroom door, as she told him again and again not to come in, that she just needed a little more time to get well. Finally, late at night, my father had opened the door, just a crack, peering in. Audrey lay in bed under a quilt, a small lamp on beside her. She stared at the ceiling, breathing softly and evenly. Around her mouth was a ring of dried blood. The discovery, a year later, of a tobacco can half full of the stuff had caused my father to watch Audrey much more closely and slowly begin to separate from her as she endured 
lengthy, unexplained illnesses, and wild energy swings. At 16, my father had found Audrey lying in the backyard, dazed, the knuckles on her left hand smeared with blood. When he roused her, she merely rose, walked past him, made him a box of macaroni and cheese for dinner, and asked him if he'd had a good day at school. It had been the middle of his summer vacation. He hadn't been to school for over a month. He ran away from home in the following week and rarely saw her again. Mom swore me to secrecy about our meeting there in the coffee house, and I kept my word. But two days later, I got a piece of mail from my father. A handwritten note said this. How many times have I tried to impress on you the need to empathize with people who live differently and that they should never be judged or outcast? But look at this photo and remember it. Love, Dad. I lifted a black and white photograph from the envelope. He'd found it as a teenager and had kept it his whole life. In the photo, some people were gathered at a basement party, each holding up to the camera a very small champagne flute filled with a dark liquid. Audrey, wearing a long flower dress, did the same. Each of those smiling people, her included, had something small impressed upon their foreheads. My eyesight was good enough 28 years ago to see that they were dark thumbprints. Someone had long ago written a caption below the photo in faded marker. The word said, Sanguinarians and Donors Party, July 24, 1954. Sanguinarians and Donors. I had become fascinated by my grandmother by then. You see, since my adolescence, I had learned a little something about compulsion myself. The consuming need to engage in a very specific and possibly self-destructive behavior. I had one of my own. Something very different from Audrey's. But I had begun to wonder how much my ungovernable subconscious was like hers. What was the interior of the house like? Cluttered, a lot of stuff flying around, knickknacks, not very clean. Did you see any evidence of unusual behavior, out of the ordinary behavior? Uh, not of the kind I'd been concerned about. My fascination and fear for my own steadiness of mind was what sent me to my grandmother's home on 530 Lamp Road, in a rural section of town nine miles from the apartment I shared with my fiancé. It was 2.30 p.m., July 15th, 1992. My grandmother seemed to have no phone number, so I showed up unannounced. I had set out to go grocery shopping that day, but wound up caving into my curiosity. Lamp Road was unlined and decaying, along its borders, and it split off in two places onto gravel roads, cutting through short stretches of woods. I followed an arrow I spotted on a tree and bumped along for about a hundred shady yards to a clearing where a modular home sat on a wide, grassy lot. The lot sloped gently upwards towards a long, chain-link fence. Beyond the fence were parked rows of school buses, it didn't seem to be in operation. Maybe they were being repaired by the county out here in the middle of nowhere. Or maybe they'd long since become scrap. Insects buzzed in the weeds all around. I parked my car near an old ice cream truck, bearing the words, Summer Island Creamery, painted in pink and orange. I got out, starting to sweat fast in the afternoon humidity, Thunderclouds were rolling away after a noon shower, but the sun was still nowhere. 
It occurred to me that this was the kind of scene my father must have run from long ago, never to return to a rural life of struggle, a house in need of painting, a no trespassing sign in a dirty window, and weeds choking a rusting lawnmower beside the stump of a tree. I went up and knocked on an unlatched screen door. I felt relief when I thought maybe no one was here. But then the door was pushed outward, and there she was, Grandma Audrey. She wore a green t-shirt with the name of a local church on it, and baggy shorts. I told her who I was. Her initial look of confusion and suspicion softened. She looked at me in quiet wonder, without ever really smiling. And after a very awkward hug, she invited me in to talk. The place smelled like Lysol and cabbage. No air conditioning. Mismatched furniture, lots of knickknacks lying around, but no photographs, no mementos. Even with the shades all up, it was kind of dark. This small, prefabricated house that had probably been delivered to this lot on a truck decades before. Grandma Audrey brought me iced tea poured from a plastic pitcher into a glass with Schroeder from the Peanuts cartoons on it. I sat in a wicker chair and she sat across from me on a dark purple sofa. The TV, which sort of looked secondhand, was off and a little dusty. When my grandmother spoke, She didn't bring up the past, and I didn't either. She seemed only politely interested now in where I had gone to school, what my hobbies were, when I'd gotten engaged, what my master's degree studies would be in. There were one or two questions about my father's and mother's current health. Audrey herself was as pale as when I'd seen her under the courthouse lighting and moved with the slowness of someone a fair bit older than 58. She looked very small on the sofa. Her responses to my questions were short and direct and didn't allow much room for exploration. I felt so foolish as I sat there drinking that flavorless iced tea. I would never be able to ask her what I really wanted to. When did you first feel the overpowering, need to keep doing something you knew would so isolate you? When did you decide not to fight it anymore? And is that what I should do with a different compulsion, one that was starting to threaten the nice, normal adulthood I'd tried to plan for myself? I was looking for help, but there was no comfort level here, no familial bond, And no answers. Just an unwell woman wanting to live her small, shunned life in peace. I limped through a few questions about the things she liked to read and began to look for a way out of the conversation. I heard a door open down a hallway and turned my head. A man was emerging from the only bedroom in the house. He moved slowly toward the living room wearing a dark blue bathrobe over not one but two sweaters and dark corduroy pants, bare feet. He was very, very tall, almost six and a half feet, and thin to the point of emaciation. This man stopped before entering the living room and looked at me hard. His hollow blue eyes were locked in a state of seemingly permanent alarm as if every sight in creation was deeply troubling to him. His hair was home-cut, extremely short, uneven, and unkempt. He was slightly hunched over, like from some premature nutritional deficiency. I thought then that he couldn't have been much older than I was, maybe 25. This is my boyfriend, Jody, my grandmother said. Jody did not approach me for a handshake. He stood rooted in place, eyes frozen. I saw that his hands trembled a little. 
Come sit down here near me, Audrey told him. And he took the place beside her on the sofa. I tried not to stare at the most dramatic feature of Jody's appearance. The left half of his neck was very discolored, the rough, furrowed skin there seemingly patched on in a wide place where much of the neck was simply gone. He had yet to say anything at all. Grandma's boyfriend. His skinny body swam in those two sweaters. It was as if he were trying to appear bulkier in a misguided projection of vanity. I asked Jody what he did. Walk dogs, he said. Audrey added that he was attacked by one two years ago. He does magic tricks, too, she said. He's very good. She rose to get him a glass of iced tea. I shifted awkwardly in my chair and asked Jody what his inspiration had been for that, for his magic. Houdini, he said, his weird, wide-eyed glare never fading. Where did you park? he asked me. I told him I'd parked just in front, near the ice cream truck. Was that a going business? I asked. At that moment, Audrey returned and held the new glass out to Jody, touching it gently to his knee and waiting for him to cradle it with his hands. She was just a little unsteady, and a few drops went over the rim of the glass, touching Jody's corduroys. Oops, my grandmother said gently. Jody's haunted-looking eyes grew even bigger, and he drew a huge, quavering breath into his lungs as if she just touched a hot poker to his leg, and he was processing the pain in stages. He craned his head slowly toward her as she apologized and patted his shoulder. Jody looked like a man utterly confused and panicked by the slightest discomfort or deviation from what he thought the next moment would bring. At the same time, he looked like an elaborate, crudely made marionette that was being controlled by an unseen hand. When he eventually exhaled and settled again, he clenched his glass of iced tea tightly, but did not drink from it. Audrey told me that no one had even touched the truck in years. It was there when she'd moved in. That truck won't run and no one's even got a key, Jody said. Don't even bother with it. It can't be sold. I was about to affirm that I had no interest in buying their ice cream truck, but I kept quiet. I had never felt more like I had stepped into another world where I did not belong and was not welcome. I decided that if three more seconds passed without either one of them saying anything, just three more, I would tell them I had to get to work and go. But then Jody asked why I had come. I said I had just been curious to meet my grandmother for the first time. But he said, Why? Today. I honestly don't remember how I responded. I was overwhelmed with the need to get out of there. I blundered a few more nonsensical things, and then I remember being at the front door again, with Jody still sitting stone-faced on the sofa, shaking his head from side to side for some reason, though I'd said nothing to cause such a reaction. My grandmother followed me. I wasn't able to summon the good grace to offer a hug at the doorway. I gave her an awkward half wave instead and did the same for Jody, barely looking at him. And then I was out the rusty screen door and free of them. And at what point did you notice the cords on the ground? There, in the grass. As soon as I started heading back to my car, at a different angle now, so. What did you think they were? Well, I could just hear the sound coming from inside the truck, kind of a humming sound. So I figured power was being run from the house into the truck, 
to some kind of appliance. Why do you think it was that you didn't hear the humming on your way in? I don't know. I think maybe spotting the cables made me stop for just a second and things were quiet. And when you say just a second, how long exactly? Literally just a second. I mean, I was walking and then I spotted the cables in the tall grass there and it was just a hesitation in my step, you know. It was quiet enough to barely hear that sound. I know my refrigerator at home, for example, kicks on and off in a cycle, so maybe it was on a breaker. I honestly don't. Do you think Jody Byrne may have been watching you from inside the house and spotted you hesitate, and maybe he thought you saw the handprint on the side of the truck and heard that humming sound? And that was what made him decide to take action. I'm not sure. Okay. Go on. <clears throat> I got in my car and I got back onto that feeder path, that gravel road between the trees. And I accelerated kind of slow because I was rolling up my windows and putting the AC on. I was going real carefully. I didn't want to pop a tire or something because there were so many potholes in, in that gravel road. And I was about halfway down the path. It was only like 100 yards. And I saw the guy, Jody, in the rearview mirror. He was running down the path toward the car as fast as he could. I literally thought at first it was a big animal or a hawk because the bathrobe, the bathrobe he was wearing was billowing out as he ran he was holding an axe he had both hands on it that's what made me swerve and hit the brakes at the same time I know hitting the brakes was the exact opposite of what I should have done but it was instinct, it was shock I hit that rut on the side of the path and the whole left side of the car shook I bounced right off the seat and when I recovered myself he already had so much momentum that I went into self-defense mode instead of trying to floor it out of there. He came up on my left side. He was just a blur, and he was swinging the head of the axe at the window, and it shattered, exploded into my face on the first swing. But the car kept rolling forward, and then it hit the side of the rut and stopped. So he had the chance to come at me through the window while I was trying to swat away all the glass. I was panicking because I felt I felt it hit my face and a little bit of glass went into my mouth. I was trying to cough it out as I was waving my arms. I had my eyes closed. And then he must have lunged in with his entire head because I felt his mouth on my neck. I could feel him trying to bite down right on the front of it right here I had my right hand on the car phone receiver and just for any kind of self defense I swung it up into his face and the top edge of it hit him right in the center of the forehead and that got him out of the window I opened my eyes finally and he was staggering backwards and he just sat down kind of collapsed in the rut he dropped the axe and there was a gout of blood running down his face from where I'd hit him with the top edge of the phone over his eyes his nose his mouth just this gout he was staring at me I got out of the car and then he just he just fell over backwards in that sitting position all at once. Did you try to administer any sort of aid to Mr. Burr? No. I looked at him and I just, he looked dead. The car phone receiver was still in my hand. It had come apart. I hit him so hard, the two halves of the phone were split apart. And I turned and started to walk back up the path toward my grandmother's house. And 
what were you hoping to accomplish there? I don't know, I told the detective. I don't know. There was blood on my right hand from the strike to Jody's forehead, and the tiny cuts on my face and neck from the shattered glass had painted me with even more. My steps were unsteady and labored. All the colors of the world seemed impossibly vivid. The dappling effect of alternating light and shadow that streamed through the trees above me was disorienting, and I kept squinting it away. The humming sound coming from the ice cream truck could not have been more obvious now, even above the buzzing of the insects as I stepped back onto the grass in the clearing. I walked up to the screen door and pulled on it, but now it was latched. I put my face to the mesh and looked in. There were three people now, three figures standing in a semicircle in the living room. My grandmother and two others, one young, heavily tattooed woman and one very old man in black with hair down to his shoulders. They were all facing the screen door and I understand now that they had been waiting, waiting to see whether it was Jody or me who returned. Their expressions were sad, weary. Upon seeing me, they all exchanged a glance and a silent, mutual decision was made, because now no one was left among them who was willing to kill to keep the secret of the ice cream truck. Each of them bent to lift a glass off the wobbly storage chest that served as a coffee table. One of the glasses was the Schroeder design that I had sipped iced tea from. Now it was half filled with blood, as were the others. Without delay, Audrey and her acquaintances raised their glasses simultaneously to their lips and drank, eyes closed tilting their heads back to drain the contents in one long, savored motion. I pulled on the door harder, shouting at them through the screen to let me in. By the time their glasses were emptied, with a thick, crimson trail left staining the interior curves of each one, I was yanking on the door so hard it was nearly coming out of its frame. The young woman, blonde and tall, reached her left hand into one pocket of her gray hooded sweatshirt. From it, she pulled a small oblong object. With her right hand, she hooked her forefinger around a detonation pin and yanked it free. She set the grenade down on the trunk between them gently. I had no more than three seconds to turn and run in the direction of the ice cream truck hoping to get behind something large before the explosion. I didn't even come close. I thought at the end that my grandmother turned her head and looked at me in apology, and with a simple maternal fondness that had needed no contact in 22 years to be genuine. A thunderclap erupted from inside the house and I felt something strike the back of my head. I went down hard into the weeds, then fire as a huge piece of burning wood fell squarely upon my back. The fire was expunged in an instant by the hailstorm of dirt and debris that roared above me. Just beyond my outstretched arm, I saw the ice cream truck through a swirling brown dust cloud that blotted out the sky. The truck in which police soon discovered Jody Burr's refrigerated and mostly desanguinated 19-year-old murder victim. When that cloud cleared from 530 Lamp Road, it left just one victim of tenacious compulsion to tell the tale. People have shown me great sympathy over the decades for my problem. Even my ex-wife, who left me after I gave away most of the money we'd saved during our marriage in another blind act of spontaneous and reckless altruism. The doctors tell me it's a narcissistic disorder, this ruinous habit that's left me with nothing to my name. On weekends, my teenage daughter hugs me sometimes and says pityingly, you're 
a good person, Dad. And I want to defend the great-grandmother Jenna grew up thinking of as a monster and tell her the only difference between that woman and the man who keeps giving everything he has to strangers is one mysterious quirk of chemical imbalance or imperfect nurturing. I think minuscule divergences are all that separate the good and evil, the lost and the saved. When Jenna visits, she never knows that I keep Audrey there with us, unseen and unjudged. <laughs>